Love staying informed? Subscribe now and get unlimited access to local news, weather, and sports for just 99 cents a month for your first three months at inform.news join. Read every story, listen to every podcast, and download the apps that keep you informed and on the go 24 hours a day. So head to inform.news slash join right now to subscribe. What are you waiting for? Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month at inform.news slash join. to plain talk so during the last well the last legislative it was the legislative session earlier this year it seems like so long ago but it really wasn't it was just weeks ago that our lawmakers were in bismarck um doing uh, well doing their jobs you know a part of that um session one of the storylines that i followed pretty closely was some dissatisfaction with the job that that state auditor Josh Gallion is doing. Now, if you don't know, in North Dakota, the auditor is a independently elected office and uh, the current office holder is Josh Gallion. He's a Republican. And there's been some complaints on on a number of fronts that the costs of audits have gone up significantly under his leadership, which is to say that the, the cost that his office charges for instance local government so that would be like a like a city count a county commission or uh or even you know one of the one of the storylines was an ambulance service out in Kildare who, who got audited so um the costs are going way up there's also been a feeling that Galleon likes to sensationalize the findings of his audits in in some dramatic testimony before a legislative committee uh members of the Gwinner Fire District, which is a volunteer fire department, came and played audio of Galleon at a uh, on a talk radio show where he was making some claims that were not in keeping with the findings of his own audit. So there's been a lot of complaints. The legislature responded to that um, by doing a couple of things. They put in place some new reporting requirements for the auditor where he has to come to a legislative committee and make regular reports about uh, the, the, his job performance. Um, also, the legislature appropriated five hundred thousand dollars for a performance audit of the auditor. The auditor is getting audited, and now the new chair of the committee that oversees these things. It's called colloquially, it's called Lafferty. It stands for Legislative Audit and Fiscal Review Committee. Uh, the new chair of that committee is Representative Emily O'Brien. She's a Republican from Grand Forks. Uh, or, or yeah, Republican from Grand Forks. I don't know why I thought I messed that up I, in my head for a minute. I, I, I thought I screwed up, but no, I said it right. Um, she's the new chair. She was also a critic of, uh, of Galleons, and now she's going to be overseeing some of these new accountability measures for his office. Emily, welcome to the program. Of course, we're also joined by my co-host, Ben Hansen. Emily, how you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So, Tell me, first of all, where we're at in terms of, uh, you know, you, you're the new chair of the Laffer C committee. You're going to be overseeing some of these things for the auditor. Talk about what in your mind is obviously the whole committee is going to weigh in. But what in your mind is, is the right approach to this? Well, so I, I'm going to even back up a little bit further and how we got here. So I last interim session um, was appointed as the vice chair of Laffer C. And so I had a couple of agencies that had reached out and expressed concerns, but didn't want to publicly uh, come out with their concerns of what was happening. And so I dug in and just started doing random samplings of reaching out to political subdivisions, different agencies, the process, how the audits work, um, how the, the financing of things go, like where what funds does it come from to pay for these audits to really get an understanding. And there was a, um, you know, repetitive pattern of there was frustration that the audit bills were doubling and tripling. Some of them increased by over 212%. And so that was um, eye opening for me. And it wasn't a, uh, you hear conversations or people posting on social media or whatever that this was a personal attack. This is not a personal attack. This is um, about checks and balances. And that's what the legislature does um, 
for any state agency. Well, we at, need- at one point, at one point during the session, Auditor Galleon came, he wrote uh, a, a a press release that came from his office. His office uh, communications person sent this out to, to the news media, accusing yeah. law making broad accusations of corruption and backroom deals. He's walked back from that somewhat. He's expressed to me that he regretted sending it. He's also tried to claim that he wasn't talking about all lawmakers. Uh, People can go look up and read his statement for themselves. But that was part of the reaction where he was characterizing this as a political or a personal attack on him. And you're saying, no, it was rooted in what I was hearing from a lot of the people who get audited by Galleon. Correct. And that we... um had the state auditor and team in front of us in the legislature and had the opportunity, you know, to address the letter and, and didn't want to have that conversation, which is fine there. You know, there's no hard feelings on my end. It's, uh, you know, trying to move forward and doing what's best for the people and that pay for these audits, which are the taxpayers, no matter if it's a political subdivision, ambulance district, the taxpayers are paying for them or a state agency. And I think someone outside of this process, um, Representative O'Brien, would kind of be, they're kind of scratching their head wondering, because if they don't, frankly, if it comes down to knowing you, knowing um, uh, Josh Galleon, they're kind of wondering who's watching the Watchmen. Is there precedent for the legislature to specifically oversee? Because essentially what it sounds like to maybe the layperson is that you're auditing the auditor. And is that standard practice? Is it new? And then what what triggered your investigation into these things where you started finding these patterns? So, yes, the, it has been in um, Century Code that it is up to um, the discretion of the legislature to do an audit um, on the auditor's office. And it, again, where the checks and balances for all the all these state agencies, it's not just the auditor's office. And um, there's been audits done on um Water Commission, the Dickinson State University. This isn't anything that's unique. And um, like I had mentioned previously, it was uh, agencies that had, you know, expressed their concerns to me. And then when it wasn't just two of them and it ended up being, or not just one of them, but it ended up being three of them. And then when I started digging in and then uh, literally doing a random sampling, I just you know, I dove in, I said, okay, I'm going to figure out how this process works, who gets audited, because I didn't want um, almost any like biased information. I wanted to be able to get an understanding for myself, ask those questions, and then hear the stories. And so that's uh, just kind of how I dove in. And then more and more people started reaching out to me saying, hey, you know, this is our story. This is our situation. What do we do? We're afraid because of retaliation. If we speak out, you know, we're in the middle of an audit right now. How do we approach this? Do you have any idea why someone else wasn't doing this before you were doing it? Because you kind of just, you you answered in part why the entities that were being audited maybe didn't speak up because they didn't want to ruffle feathers while they were under audit. But I think that's what you're describing is maybe the opposite of the impression of of North Dakota state government that that's a, you know, small town with a lot of long roads in between. It it seems like this was going on for a bit. Do you know why there wasn't something or someone in place to oversee this or for them to report to or make a complaint to previously? Well, so there, there is, that's what Laffer C is. That's the oversight. Um, And I guess I was uh, not necessarily naive, but I've served on industry business and labor and transportation committees, my previous sessions. And so I would say this was more on the appropriation side of things that we're seeing this in um, since 2017, I believe there had been several conversations, several bills that had been introduced each session to continue to streamline and, um, you know, really tighten up or focus the directives for the state auditor's office. And um, I think, you know, the way that it was portrayed initially when I had first introduced my bill was like, Oh, another session, another attack on the auditor's office. And that that was a direct quote from an op-ed he put in the paper for everyone to read. Yeah. And that is so far from the truth because I didn't realize that there had been conversations from previous sessions um, to address that. And so it was more so realizing after the fact that there had been several attempts to to address um, 
certain concerns and situations, it was like, okay, we really need to nail this down because we keep having the same conversations, but nothing is changing. And so how do we ensure that, you know, all sides are working together to, to get the outcomes that we're looking for? Well, one of the complicating factors here is auditors, uh, I would, I would add maybe much like journalists, a lot of times get criticism that's not motivated by any actual deficiencies in the job that they're doing, but just that people don't like having certain things. Exposed. The auditor's got a tough job. I, I don't think everybody agrees on that, where sometimes you have to go out there and you have to identify problems. I mean, when, when the auditor does a good job, a lot of times it exposes real problems that are hard for people to accept or they don't want to accept them, what have you. How did you weed what was going on? Because I agree with you, and I, I've talked to the number of these people, and I, I think when you look at the increase in costs, I'm still scratching my head about why these audits are so much more expensive. When I hear, you know, situations where, you know, the auditor's office was talking to different people and spreading information, you know, about about audits that, in you know, that happened in Killdeer, where, you know, the, the auditor's office was, was, was what I would describe as leaking information out that ended up... Uh, having an impact on an election to 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 for for a, for a mill levy increase for the ambulance service where it ended up getting defeated and some of it had to do with information that leaked from an incomplete audit. I mean these are these are real problems, but how did you how did you make sure that it wasn't just sour grapes where the people that the auditor's office is supposed to hold accountable just didn't want to be hold accountable so they're attacking the auditor. That's got to be a fine line to walk. Well, and so I you know, being in business, we do insurance audits. And so I had no problem. You know, I understand where both sides are coming from because I've gone through audits before and it's like, okay, you want to make sure that you're doing the best policies and practices possible to avoid any sort of hiccups or negative outcomes in the end. And so I think people were, you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. And so people were eager to make sure that they were doing the right processes I think the main issue and concern was that people felt like they were trying to do the right thing. And it, if they were doing the wrong thing, they didn't know that they were doing the wrong thing. But then we're dragged through the mud and the media painting a picture that there was criminal activity going on. And that was couldn't be further from the truth. And so um, I think people felt like they were being attacked, but didn't have an opportunity to even defend themselves uh, that. They were trying to do the right thing. They were in good faith of doing what um, people expected of them and, again, couldn't defend themselves. And their opportunity to defend themselves is through reporting to the Legislative Audit and Fiscal Review Committee or when a bill gets introduced to tell their story. And, you know, and for the average person, maybe government entities, it's it's uh, a little different, but I don't know they know that kind of complexity, that nuance. And... Uh, Representative O'Brien, how are you? Uh, have has the committee had any meetings since the legislative session? Is it on the docket right now? How can a member of the public kind of read or see or interact with these meetings that you're having it here in the interim? So we just got done um, two weeks ago. I think it was. Time has been kind of flying by this summer already. Um, two weeks ago, legislative management we. Um, put all of our legislators to their respective committees, committee assignments. And so we are looking at scheduling the next Lafferty meeting around the first or second week in August. And so it's just a matter of coordinating schedules and I'm working with council. And so that's when that first uh, legislative audit and fiscal review committee will be. And then we'll already have a slate of what audits will be going through. And then I've had a couple other entities reach out that want to, um, present and so we'll have give them an opportunity to come in present and tell their stories as well. What I, I want to talk a little bit about the new expectations that that the last legislature put in place for the auditor's office. So first is is the new reporting requirements. Where is it quarterly? I think that the auditor has to come in and report to the committee on on certain things. What are your as the chair of that that committee? What are your expectations of those reports? I mean, exactly how we laid them out. And yes, it is quarterly. And so because Laffer Seed meets quarterly by code. And so, you know, to ensure that those requirements are happening, one of the biggest things that we saw was the units that were being charged for pricing. People want 
an itemized breakdown of what they're being billed. And rightfully so, they deserve to have that information of, you know, how many hours are going into these audits? What are they, you know, looking into? Um, some entities felt like they were providing documents two or three times and then also being billed for the second and third time that they were providing those documents. And so, you know, being transparent and um, holding each other to the same standards that, you know, he's requiring of doing those audits. I think that's the most appropriate way to, to move forward. Have you had any one-on-one -on -one conversations with the state auditor either during the session or after about kind of expectations or goals for the committee leading into the next legislative session and these audits? We were supposed to have one on Monday, but I had to cancel because I had a, um, another meeting go long. But we are going to be having one um, here after the 4th of July. That makes sense. When you'd mentioned before, I just wanted to follow up. You you mentioned about you know something to the tune of 216 or somewhere around there increases in costs in audits year to year as you were doing random sampling. Can you, for further context, let us know like what were some of the dollar figures there? And I ask that because sometimes when we throw you know numbers around in the legislature, they'll be like, "This building permit got increased by two hundred percent." Then you find out it was a small construction building permit that went from twenty five dollars to fifty dollars. I'm guessing that's not the case here, but can you give uh, listeners a little bit more context into those? Yeah. So, and I just threw the two hundred twelve percent number out because that's oh. one that just stuck to my head, but. Um, I mean, some audit fees only had a 5% increase and some of them went up to 212. And so one that I can think of off the top of my head was a state agency, um, even as of recently, three weeks ago, went from $142,000 audit fee to $198,000 audit fee. And so that is significant increase. And when the programs haven't changed why would there be an increase in, in the audit fees? And so it's something that we're going to dig into and, and find out. And to be clear, I mean, ultimately, all of those audit fees are paid by the taxpayers. I mean, that that's where the money's yep. coming from. And a lot of times, some of the fees, if you're talking about an ambulance service or a rural fire department, um, you know, a 25 percent or 30 or whatever, whatever the percentage ends up to be increase in their audit costs. That is a major, major hit that they have to figure out how to how to accommodate. Um, let, let's talk about the performance audit for the auditor's office for a minute. Uh, and Rob, one oh, second, sorry, just to, you know, for that for budgeting purposes. I mean, a lot of these state agencies, we just got done with a legislative session for, you know, biennium. That's two years. They have to budget for those audits and how much they're going to cost. And if those audit fees are over what they were from the previous year, the year before that, they then have to figure out and scramble, okay, where do we cut that was already approved by the legislature or by our local school board or city council or county board? How are we going to scramble and figure out how to pay these bills? Yeah. And so that's a big, big piece. And with, the local, with the local entities, you already have factors such as just basic snowfall. When you're talking about county budgets or firefighter budgets, you don't know how much of those services they're going to use and to have a unsteady audit fee on top of that, I, I mean, I'd be pulling my hair out if I were on one of those local boards because uh, almost $200,000 is a big, big dent. In and some, a budget some of, of them are there. anywhere from like, I think Grand Forks went from a 20 because Grand Forks County was one that I uh, dabbled into and I reached out to our local um, county auditor and I believe it went from like 19000 to 22000 to 42000 you know, around those numbers. And so trying to figure out the justification for those dollars. It was um, said that it was because of COVID dollars that were received, but still I'm not sure that it would result and in anything. And I get but you're looking at an audit that's the cost of an entire FTE for most of these places. That just... Uh. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it's it's really... And one of the things I noticed too when I when I wrote about this is I, I some of the records I got back, the communications from the auditor's office, when they would send an invoice for the audit um there wasn't a lot of information on it it just i mean i i'm forgetting what the line item but it was like one line item said you got you know something like you got audited and then yep. a dollar figure and that was it not not there was no, no there's no real explanation and, and to this i mean there's still a lot of people who are bewildered and i'm not sure you know i've asked the auditor about this and he's you know he's talked about 
um, you know, how thorough they are and things like that. But there's just there's no no specific like, well, this this agency that we're, we audited had, you know, they had, you know, 15 new people doing, you know, three new programs. And so the scope of the audit expanded that that understandable answered um, is not there. I haven't heard it, but I, I do want to talk before we end about the performance audit. And I mean, where where is that? It has Who's going to perform the audit? Is it in the works yet? When do you expect it to be completed? So that is directed from legislative management, the chair. So that's um, Chair LaFour. But then the way that I understand is that an RFP will be issued. So it'll be a third party audit that's done um, and private entities will respond and they'll, they'll go through the, the RFP process. And I would assume have, you know, specific directives of, hey, this is what we're looking at auditing and then um, go forward from there. And so I'm not sure who the audit will be reported to, but that's um, kind of the process. And I, I think that they want to just get the ball rolling because there's so many studies and things that are in the works. So just, just getting things moving and shaking. Um, but once, once the RFP is issued, it will uh, go from there. Do you feel like there's I mean, one one thing that we talked about was fear of blowback from the auditor's office and and the audit I mean really they can do they could swing a big stick in terms of public relations and and, and by that mm -hmm. I mean if the auditor's office sends out and they say oh we had all these findings for a school district or something um I mean a lot of times I I, I hate to say it but the public's not going to go and read the audit and if you have an auditor who is prone to sensationalizing they can do a lot of damage and i know that was one thing when i was reporting on this is a lot of people i had a lot of people who did not want to talk on the record because they were scared that i don't want to be drugged through the mud by this auditor and it wasn't just you know i i wrote about you know the um uh, you know the the Gwinter Fire District and the Kildare Ambulance Service but we had a previous situation where this auditor and and a former commerce commissioner uh, Michelle Comer, where where she really felt that the auditor made some accusations of criminal activity that that turned out not to be turned out not to be the case, but she you know her and some of her staff had personal to, legal fees, right? They, they you know so now you have state officials who are being audited by the state auditor who made accusations of of criminal misconduct or or suggested that there may have been criminal misconduct, and then had to pay for lawyers out of their own pockets to try to defend themselves. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think one, one very yeah. interesting part of all this is just fear of retaliation. Like, like everybody's been kind of afraid to talk about, and maybe that's to Ben's point. Why didn't this come up earlier? I, I think there was a fear here. Nobody wants to take on the auditor. Go ahead, Ben. Well, Representative O'Brien, if that were to happen again in a, an analogous, not analogous, a similar situation to either another elected official or to a one of these smaller you know like rob was referencing rural fire department uh rural school district something like that and you were to be made aware of it what would the end result be because i'm i'm trying to think of it from the perspective of an outsider just looking at gov their government going to work you know an auditor auditing and you as a representative overseeing that if they're not happy with that, which I would kind of assume someone getting into all the weeds wouldn't be, and they've seen Josh Gallion, frankly, set that precedent, and he does it, let's say he does again, I hesitate to say under your watch because he doesn't work for you, but you are overseeing him. What are the repercussions or what, what actions can be taken? Because so far, frankly, there's not much outside of now he's going to have to report them. And I... What I don't like about my questions, it sounds like I'm trying to set you up to be a finger wagger or like a, a punisher of some sort. And I know that's one, not what you're trying to do, nor is it the purpose of it. But if you remember the public, you got to wonder, well, okay, what's happened? What, why, what's preventing him from doing this again in the future? Now we have this distinct pattern. Well, and I think that's the beautiful process of our democracy is you get to go vote. If you don't like what he's doing or how um, he's running the office as a state auditor, that's that's how that process works. And same for me. If I, you know, I'm not doing what people are expecting of me, that's, they can go and vote me out or run someone against me. And that's, uh, that's the best part about our process. But I think 
my end goal is, you know, I went from three different entities reaching out to me to over 60 different entities reaching out of, you know, hey, this was our story and trying to figure out how do we proceed and move forward. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that's what we can do during this interim. And then it may result in legislation. But how do you um, legislate behavior? That's something that I struggle with. Uh, 60 entities. Were those all public taxpayer funded entities or were some of those private? They're, everything is public that goes through the state auditor's office. No, no, no. no, no. Private oh, entity. oh, sorry. Got it. Got it. So it was all publicly funded. Uh, and are those 60 entities, are they going to be, have they been named as reaching out to you or their confidentiality there or? I have told people that I'm more than happy to be confidential just because they were either in the middle of audits or they had just finalized um, or they're up for an audit coming up. And so um, keeping them, you know, confidential and just trying to help them navigate the process to the best of my ability. What and that's you know I think a final point that's important here is is sometimes to, to your point Emily, I think sometimes when we see a problem in an office, the reaction is 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 almost consequences that are more for the office. And so, you know, I, I I've always wanted to be very careful. I like that we have an independent auditor who has a lot of latitude. I like that the auditor is accountable directly to the voters, and I like that they have a lot of latitude to to hold state government accountable and to root out problems and, and hopefully put us on a track to solve those problems. And so I, I've always wanted to be careful when we're dealing with a situation like this, that just because you may have somebody in the office who is not using the powers of that office appropriately, that's not necessarily an argument for changing the powers of the office. That's an argument. That's a personnel problem. Not a, Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I encourage audits. I encourage, you know, making sure that we are doing things properly, that we are doing things accurately, because I think that's what I guess I'm a type A OCD person. I want to make sure we're doing um, right and properly and that we're in compliance with the laws. And I mean, not only state laws, but federal laws. We have, you know, a lot of different programs and services that we offer and taxpayer dollars that need to be held accountable. And it, we have workforce shortage problem. I mean, there's entities that are struggling to find the appropriate people to run and do these uh, accounting practices and whether it's a school board or a, a school district or a county, wherever. And so, um, you know, doing those checks and balances is so important, but when it becomes zealous and uh, stretched, if you will, that's, um, that's when I think, you know, it's not productive anymore. It's a, a gotcha kind of mentality, and that's where people are struggling. Well, I, I think I, your, your point about, we got to wrap this up, but your point about workforce, I think, is well made because there are. I mean, just about every every agency in state government is struggling to hire, struggling to retain. And I don't blame those workers. I mean, they're, I mean the workers are, are going to do, but I, it's a harder pitch when you watch state, you know, state employees get raked over the coals by their own auditor, get maybe accused of crime. I mean, we had the state librarian kind of went through the similar thing. Yeah. It, it becomes hard to uh, becomes hard to recruit people to work in state government. Last Re last comment to you, Ben. Representative Ryan, well, yeah, the clock's got us. But uh, doing some quick political math here, I've noted you are a two term representative. You are up for election next year. Uh, represent or uh, state auditor Galleon is also a two-term uh, state auditor up for election next year. Would would this ever be something that you would consider running for statewide? Have you heard of any other Republicans looking to run for this position, given his comments on the legislature that you serve in very publicly last session? Good oh, question, gosh. Ben. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do not have any aspirations to run um, for the state auditor. I do not have an accounting background. I'm not a CPA. Um, I can do basic books for our business and do those checks and balances. I'm good at digging into stuff and, and organizing in the details, but do not have any aspirations. I um, will see if I'll run again. I still have some time to decide that, but. Not. Emily, you're, you're a serious person. I appreciate you entertaining my crass political questions, but we are also a North Dakota politics show. So what I'm taking from your answer is that you're considering running for governor since Doug Burgum is running for president. And we'll just leave it there. You have a good night. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, my gosh. All right. On that note, we're going to end the interview. Thanks for taking us Thank completely off the rails, Ben. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you, Emily.
Hi there, my name is James Walner. I produce and host the podcast Dakota Spotlight, a true crime podcast that tackles historical and unsolved crimes in the upper Midwest. Follow along with me as we search for a missing girl, attempt to solve a 45-year-old murder, and much, much more. That's Dakota Spotlight Podcast, anywhere you get your podcasts, or at inform.com slash podcasts. Well, just wrapped up our interview with Representative Emily O'Brien. That's certainly a situation to uh, to watch in the Laffer C Committee as that unfolds. Um, but now we're going to switch gears here, and we're going to talk about taxes and who who better to have on to talk about taxes than the tax commissioner brian crosses who's a republican uh and by the way brian i I brought you on to talk about property taxes because we're there's a uh, there's a ballot measure we're going to have the property tax debate again um they're going to be collecting signatures i uh, you know at this point i i I think just about anybody who wants to put an issue on a ballot can our our signature Mm -hmm. gathering process is porous but that's a topic for another show. Um, I expect this issue to be on the ballot. I expect us to have another debate about eliminating property taxes. I know that North Dakotans are perpetually upset about their property taxes. But before we get to any of that, let's talk about the sales tax, because your office put out some sales tax figures today that were uh, were pretty interesting. So that's a pretty big increases. Can you summarize that for us? Uh, yes, we experienced the eighth consecutive quarter of growth in terms of collections Uh, The North Dakota economy has not only gotten back to pre-pandemic levels, but it's surpassed uh, those totals now. And as compared to three, four years ago, we're performing well. It's a cyclical economy in North Dakota because of oil and gas, because of ag commodities, Mm -hmm. and just commodity pricing in general. So uh, good to see. Uh, There's a bit of an inflation factor built into these numbers as well, just the cost of goods, et cetera. They are running higher than they would have uh, under normal circumstances. Uh, Again, inflation does have somewhat of a role, but most of the growth is being driven by just a very solid economy in the state right now. And employment figures, numbers are up. That helps as well. And things are looking good, at least through the first quarter of this calendar year, which was January through March. And we report out about now on those figures because once we hit the end of a quarter, uh, March 31st, for example, then what happens, businesses and other entities have to begin sending their returns in. We process them, begin recording them. They have a month to report. And then we have about four or five weeks to uh, total the results and then provide figures to the public. So a thing I always like to remind people when we talk about taxes and revenues and budgets in North Dakota is that our state government, unless they're spending directly out of a special fund, although sometimes not even then, a lot of times what they're spending are forecasted revenues. We're not, there's not like a checking account that's got, you know, the however many billions of dollars that the legislature appropriates sitting in it. And then we just write checks out of that fund. It's a, a constant where money's coming in and then money's going out. And so when the lawmakers budget, they're budgeting based on a, a forecast, based on tax revenues we're expected to take in. And most of the time they do a pretty good job. But what always scares me when we talk about tax revenues over the last, gosh, 15 years now, I suppose, is how much of it is based on a commodity-driven economy and, and how, how quickly, I mean, as we certainly saw towards the end of Governor Dalrymple's administration, how quickly things can change. For instance, if the bottom falls out of the oil markets, um, you know, the, it, it, it's a little scary how dependent we are sometimes as much as I love our energy industry and love our agriculture industry. And this is really a question about North Dakota's diversified economy. But sometimes, Brian, it really scares me how dependent we are on those industries. Uh, we're very dependent on the oil and gas side of the equation. Lawmakers limit how much of those dollars or how many of those dollars can go into the general fund. It's uh, 200 million per year or 400 million per biennium. And when you're looking at collections in the two and a half billion, uh, this year they'll approach $3 billion mark. That in itself isn't uh, where the concern lies, but to your point, the associated revenue because of activity in the energy industry, oil and gas, as mentioned, but also on the agricultural side, that leads to more purchases occurring throughout the state. 
uh, those purchases generate revenue through sales tax. And that associated revenue is where we experience a shortfall when there's a slowdown. And that did happen, as you mentioned, in the 2015, 2017 biennium, I believe. And uh, we went from looking really good just a few years earlier to being in a budget shortfall situation. So it has to be monitored, it has to be watched very closely. And, and with a record setting budget, even though quite a bit of that is on the federal side, uh, in terms of the growth, we still have to be cognizant that it's cyclical. Things go up, things go down. Uh, they're looking good today, but if we experience a slowdown, the next biennium could be become more interesting as we move forward. And I guess uh, ev eventually I'll let Ben answer the question here, but I, I wanted to segue from there because that's kind of where I wanted to go was – um, you know, it's, there's always I, the three-legged stool is a metaphor that's often used for revenues in North Dakota. And uh, Brian's never heard that one. Uh, Brian's never heard that one before. And property taxes are obviously one leg of the the the, um, the stool. Listen, I I don't like my property tax bill as much as the next person. I get it. I understand why people were upset. Um, but one thing that that worries me a little bit is where's the revenue going to come from to replace it. So, so talk a little bit about that, about what it would be like to balance North Dakota's checkbook. If suddenly the, we didn't have the property tax anymore as a revenue source, mostly for local government. And suddenly the state government was obliged to, to replace that revenue for locals. How does that work? How do we balance the books, Brian, uh, from, from your perspective? Well, in terms of the property tax measure, they're looking at legacy fund earnings. So dollars that have already been set aside and will continue to be set aside in the future. And then taking the earnings, that's my understanding of the measure when I read the language. So it wouldn't be reliant on the day-to-day -day collections, but rather the earnings from the legacy fund. But that in itself uh, creates or uh, generates a number of questions as well. If those dollars are earmarked and they're maxed out uh, in terms of what's being earned to satisfy property tax obligations or a replacement for those revenue, uh, for that revenue that the cities, counties, uh, the political subdivisions rely on, uh, that's something that's, that has to be carefully vetted. It's, it's, a, it's a big decision uh, that voters will be making that will uh, where dollars might otherwise be spent from, again, those earnings from the legacy fund. So I think in terms of balancing the state budget, that mechanism really resides with lawmakers, the number they set in terms of overall spending. Are they adjusting accordingly for the ups and downs of the market, uh, the commodity-driven market that we talked about? And uh, But it's in the early stages in terms of uh, that measure I agree. I think they will get the signatures necessary to put it on the ballot, but there will be a lot of conversation without question going forward from both proponents and opponents of the measure. And uh, it's similar to the conversation that occurred uh, even dating back to 2012 when this was talked about, as well as 2020, which was influenced uh, in terms of the impact of COVID and how that really didn't get off the ground in terms of signature gathering, but I think we'll see it on the ballot this next time around. But if we were in budget shortfall, there is a tie back to those, those earnings. Uh, that backstop, even though we have the budget stabilization fund and some other mechanisms, rainy day funds, if you want to call it that, uh, if it's earmarked for one specific purpose and it's collected in one area to satisfy an obligation in another, uh, those dollars are still gone. They can't be used for anything else. And I don't know that there would be a lot left over without tapping into the principle. And that's that in itself is uh, not what was intended when the legacy fund was established in terms of taking principal dollars back out. It's, it's meant to be a substitute down the road if oil and gas, for example, isn't as prominent in terms of activity, revenue generation in the state. Brian, going back to the forecasting, process i've thought it long thought and admittedly it's it's my axe to grind i will copy before i ask this question but i i think it is one of the great unsung aspects of how north Dakota state government goes about its business that in addition to having legislative session and therefore only being able to set the budget only having the option to set the budget every other year north dakota as a government 
relies on these budget forecasts. For instance, the last one was actually closer to this legislative session than normal because we had a special session for redistricting, meaning we didn't have 2021 predictions, th uh, early 2021 predictions throughout. We had fall 2021 predictions. Now, looking at the numbers, and I it's an audio format, I happen to have some tax uh, numbers up on a PDF. You're able to see the screen. But as I'm reading them, you've collected about $130 million more than was planned on. Sales and personal income taxes are up. Corporate income tax collection is 16% higher than was predicted back in the fall of the 2021 session. As a tax commissioner who oversees this, do, do you see any problems with this lack of precision in forecasting? Have you spoken to the legislators about adjusting this? I know there was some work done in appropriations a few years ago to look at this forecasting, but do you have any thoughts on this or anything, or even if you disagree with me, any context to add for listeners who are wondering how the budget process goes about its business? Sure. In terms of revenue forecasting, that goes through OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, in coordination with lawmakers, leadership in particular. Uh, the governor's office is also involved uh, because that is a cabinet agency. And I, I think the, the word of caution when we're budgeting as a state and forecasting uh, to make sure that we have enough money to fund the, the priorities and the budget that is approved by lawmakers each session, it's really important that we take a conservative approach to those numbers. And if we are in fact doing that and taking a conservative approach, then we'll, we will see these types of overages, uh, positive numbers above and beyond the forecast. But at the same time, uh, what goes up can go down. And it can start yeah. to work the other way as well, that if we're in a shortfall situation where we're 16% down instead of 16% up, that creates problems. I, yeah, I, I would say I was going to maybe uh, devil's advocate you a little bit and push back and say, I don't think the predictions have only ever gone up. I think, in fact, several times they've had shortfalls. And again, I, a I, level of imprecision that I think makes budgeting a little bit sloppier is that it, have you advocated one way or another as a tax commissioner to, to maybe have uh, forecasts at least that are maybe a little bit more up to date? It would see when we're looking at things to the tune of hundreds of millions being off that another forecast couldn't be cost prohibitive to do. There are ongoing uh, conversations with Moody's and other analysts that, that the state enlists uh, for help. In terms of advocating to, to get to your question itself, uh, I've always been an advocate for being conservative in terms of how we forecast. And, but forecasting is one component we can look at the inbound revenues, but really what type of liability are we creating when these budgets are constructed and the overall number is determined? Uh, I believe this past biennium, it's in the $18.4 billion uh, around that mark. And that's a big number. Even with the federal funds, it's still a robust number. And we did see not that many years ago how quickly it turned. And this is just a few years back. Uh, and we heard it in political campaigns about uh, balancing the budget, the budget deficit uh, was talked about a billion dollars plus in terms of that deficit. We drained all the rainy day funds. They were gone uh, just to get through that, that uh, cycle. So they've been rebuilt, they've been replenished, but, uh, I think the, the word of caution is we need to be very conservative in terms of looking at these forecasts. They are toned down. Uh, oil isn't projected to be $90 or $100 when the budgeting occurs. It's taken down quite a bit. But we're also very reliant on some external sources and, and hoping that they're accurate in their predictions as well. And sometimes uh, they're accurate. Oftentimes they are, but we've seen instances where they weren't. And again, it, it goes back to just how quickly things can turn. And there, there, uh, there can also be instances where we're just not, we're just not sure. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, if I could forecast everything the oil industry is going to do, I, I probably wouldn't be a podcaster. I'd be a billionaire somewhere. Um, it's some of it's just unpredictable, um, which is just built into it, uh, commodity prices or what have you. I, I wonder, um, I, I think I think there's this unpredictability, and because North Dakota is such a commodity based, and and this is more of a philosophical point, I guess. I, I've always felt that 
pro that the t taxation should apply to a prod base and be relatively low, which I, I guess I, t in my mind, the government belongs to all of us. We should all have some degree of, of responsibility to pay for it. Um, so taxes should be broad and, and low. I mean, that's, that's my preference. And so I, I worry in a state like ours that is so dependent on, so dependent on, on oil revenue, so dependent on, on crop prices about narrowing our tax base because that's what we're doing we're eliminating a tax we're putting more spending obligation on state level revenues so that's income tax sales tax etc and and we're going to create a situation where we have a lot less flexibility when it comes if, if we run into some of these these economic headwinds things look great in north dakota right now and it's maybe easy to make a decision in this environment to say oh yeah let's get rid of the property tax I worry about what happens when things get tough. Are, are those concerns found in your mind, Brian? Absolutely. Uh, there's there's no doubt about it. Uh, and, and we have more than just those two uh, industry sectors, two business sectors uh, in the state, but they are by far uh, the largest revenue drivers overall. And again, the associated revenue that we receive from those industries are as a result of that activity. But it underscores the importance of diversifying our economy and continually looking for ways to uh, produce more different types of goods and services in the state, attract new business that that would be outside of those two primary sectors, even though we can always uh, experience and welcome growth from them. But the more we can diversify our economy, the, uh, the more stable the overall revenue picture looks uh, over the course of time. But even, even new sectors, uh, whether it's technology, these other components that are out there, they still have ups and downs as well. And uh, it's beyond our borders in terms of things that influence the marketplace. We're talking about the country as a whole. We're talking about a global economy. We're an exporter, not just other states when it comes to our energy products, for example, or agricultural products. But we move these goods worldwide. Uh, uh, particularly on the ag side. So it, it's about finding new markets. It's about diversifying our economy and having a good environment where businesses want to operate in our state. So that that's important. I believe a low tax environment promotes, not inhibits growth, because it, again, attracts new industry, new businesses. And I think that's a positive, whatever we can expand uh, our business space. There's no question about it. Brian, there's going to be that push to eliminate property taxes uh, next year. Being led by Rick Becker, there are other former and current state legislators, uh, most um, all of whom are in your political party as well, uh, who are going to be pushing for this. The social media posts I have seen so far promoting this have uh, touted that not enough has been done to reduce property tax burden on owners, uh, pro excuse me, on homeowners. In the state of North Dakota, there is some narrative, and admittedly, this is anecdotal on my part, that this could all be covered uh, using the legacy fund earnings or, or quote, other slush funds that I've seen. When I think property taxes, as a former legislator, I mostly think funding schools, and that is something that is already heavily subsidized by the Common Schools Trust Fund. I know I'm going down a rabbit hole, but brass tax for the taxpayer at home, the common schools trust fund couldn't be used to shore up anything that is offset or that would be taken away from the K through 12 budget for the state of the entire state of North Dakota. Only the legacy fund earnings could do that. The way I'm looking at it, you'd have to spend, not you, excuse me, the legislature would have to spend 28% of the funds value in order to make up for those costs in one biennium, or you'd have to raise a bunch of other taxes, which I'm guessing they don't have an appetite for. Uh, I, I personally think they want to do that and then make drastic cuts everywhere else and not make up for those things. Do you find my math to be correct there in the context for that? Do you think these can be made up? Do you think property taxes could be made up for using the legacy fund or the slush fund? Or do you disagree other, other funds that they refer to as slush funds? Or do you disagree with that narrative? It depends on what uh, inputs you use in terms of the return on that investment, the legacy fund dollars. If you're talking about a 5%, uh, for example, uh, return on, on those funds, market returns, it has to average that. 
uh, it would be very close. This past, I believe it was in 2021, uh, taxes paid in 2022 on property tax. In the property tax arena, that was approximately 1.4 billion dollars. That's the that's the obligation as of uh, 2022 collections. If we fast forward a decade from now, 15 years from now, that number could be in the three billion dollar range. Uh, so when you're looking at a principal amount in the legacy fund of uh, what does that have to be? What what does the math look like? And that has to be carefully vetted, whether or not it can cover cover that uh, obligation or if it would have to come from other areas as well. The one thing that that uh, people have to be cognizant of, if that were approved, and, and I think conceptually on the surface, people like the sound of it. Um, and it really doesn't eliminate the property tax obligation. It just really shifts how it's identified. You're talking that, about the ballot measure right now. Correct. That that funding is still, still needed. Uh, at the local level for schools, emergency services, uh, infrastructure, uh, maintenance and repair, enhancements, et cetera. So those dollars are still needed. And what we're talking about really is, is where does the funding come from? Now it comes from homeowners, property owners, and that would shift to industry. And in, in, in particular, oil and gas, since that's where the legacy fund uh, dollars are generated from. So it's it's a big shift in terms of where the funding comes from. And it will limit, there's no question, it would limit other options in terms of what those dollars might be used for and would tighten things up quite a bit. So those are those are questions that I think are fair to ask and, and should we should have answers for. And both sides, uh, opponents and proponents, are going to be lobbying uh, you know, both so ways you, on it. Yeah. So you come down on a, on a it depends. You're not you're not ready to confirm that yet, but you're not saying no. I think it's early to. I, I really want to run the numbers and see how realistic it is on the funding mechanism that's being proposed. It's, I will say this, it, it's a big decision. It's going to take a big bite out of the apple in terms of the projected earnings. And it may limit, limit. Uh, well, without question, if it passes, it wouldn't be a may, it would limit how those dollars might be repurposed otherwise. And was that the original intent of the legacy fund to begin with? Uh, some will argue, yes, it's, it's the perfect avenue and, and mechanism to, to put in place. Others will have some consternation and concern. But it, the one thing that in this whole conversation, um, it, all of when you look at property tax obligations by, by owners of homes, land, uh, commercial, commercial property, buildings, or, yeah. right. When you're looking at, at uh, what they're taxed at currently, that's driven by political subdivisions and what they determine to be their budget number for the the year or the biennium, you know, every two years, local government decides what they're going to spend. Then the values are an input, but really the mill rate is driven by what is the budget, what is the overall spend going to be for a city, for a township, for a county. That's where the mill rate is generated from. Uh, the valuation uh, of a piece of property will certainly influence taxes paid, but it really begins with the budget number. And I think a lot of times that isn't uh, talked about enough. That, that's where all of this originates. That's where the consternation really is created in terms of what property tax bills look like. There's, um, I, I always, I always when, when people lay off the blame for higher property taxes on valuations, I always like to point out, listen, we, they control the mill levy rate. Like you can, you can change the mill levies. You know, if the valuations are going up, property taxes don't automatically have to go up. Um, you know, they could change the rate at which the value is taxed in, in order to, uh, in order to, to keep property tax in line if they want to. I think the problem is they don't want to, which leads into my, uh, one thing that really concerns me about this too, is there's always an interplay between taxing and spending. And so the legislature, for instance, if they want to have more money to spend, they have to find it from somewhere. And that might mean raising a tax, although that hasn't happened in a long time. You know, it could mean raising a fee or raising a tax. They have to get the revenue from somewhere. And so what worries me is if we say, oh, well, well, the legacy fund can just replace the property tax. Well, what happens if property tax needs 
go beyond what the legacy fund produces in revenues. Um, so what if we see a massive population explosion in a part of the state and suddenly the county's there and the city's there and the park districts and, and everybody else who collects from the property tax, suddenly they need more revenue. Well, just because we've had a population explosion, unlike, you know, if if, if you have a population explosion, then then you can kind of count on, okay, well, we're going to have some more sales tax or we're going to have some more property tax because more people are living and they're building homes. They're doing all the stuff that generates tax revenues. We don't necessarily get more legacy fund revenue because we have more people in the state. So, I mean, unlike, I, I feel like we're kind of unshackling, we're, we're obligating the legacy fund to pay for something for costs that are driven by factors that are completely divorced from the legacy fund. And we're also allowing local elected officials to spend money that they're not obligated to tax for, right? Because that's the other thing. It's like, well, we'd really like to build, you know, on the park district. Well, we'd like really like to build this giant uh, water park or something. But, you know, the taxpayers are going to say no to a property tax increase. That that's that that interplay, I think, is important. I feel like we're just we're getting completely away from that where we're going to use a revenue source that has no real basis on spending needs to pay for to 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 to, to provide revenue for spending made by people who who aren't obligated to tax for it i i worry about that and again that's kind of a philosophical question but i think that's an important part of this debate brian am i am i off my rocker here i think it's a legitimate question and i think it's one that has to be answered and if if it can't be answered uh specifically it has to be taken into consideration because if there are budget shortfalls revenue shortfalls at the county level for example or within a uh, political subdivision uh, of any kind then if they don't have enough in terms of what is inbound through legacy fund earnings what's allocated to them will they be looking at increasing their local sales tax figure uh, the state taxes at five percent uh, that's the the sales tax rate uh, and uh, for most things, alcohol purchases uh, would be a, a bit higher at seven, uh, et cetera. But, you know, for most goods and services, it's, it's a 5% sales tax rate is what we apply. But then there's also a county tax that might be a half percent. Uh, there's a city sales tax that might be a percent. It might be a percent and a half. So uh, in aggregate, we see a lot of six and a half, seven percent tax rates in the state uh, overall in terms of what you see on your your uh, receipt when you make a purchase. You'll see a six and a half, seven percent sales tax, five percent is the state. Will that cause those local political subdivisions to then raise their local sales tax to try and make up for a shortfall if uh, there isn't enough money coming from from the legislature uh, or through this funding mechanism that's being proposed, I should say, by the, the special measure. So no, it's a, it's a fair question. Uh, this has to be carefully vetted and voters need to be informed okay what exactly does this mean it sounds good on the surface but what are the pros what are the cons uh positives negatives as we go through this particular process and conversation will invariably continue uh there, there's going to be a tremendous amount of conversation and dialogue surrounding this uh brian it's a thoughtful answer i would like to point out you did miss your opportunity to tell rob that he was off his rocker and we're going to need you to be a little faster about that in the future <laughs> but uh you, you i i did want to throw i want to bring up go back to something you mentioned before which is the three categories and throw a little philosophy at you where we're, we've taken up a good portion of your time now but you'd mentioned the differences between egg or land property taxes industrial or commercial property taxes and then of course, personal property for um, usually single family homes, your your um, main dwelling. I think the main heartburn folks in North Dakota and probably generally people have around property taxes are, unlike income where you're earning income, unlike sales tax where you are choosing to make a purchase, property taxes exist whether you own a house or not, whether you're taking care of it well or not, and they exist for folks who are on fixed income or retired, so on and so forth. You're a tax commissioner, I know you're well aware of this argument, but let me let me throw something out at you. I feel like when folks like Rick Becker come at um, voters with a, we're just gonna eliminate all the property taxes, do it overnight. I feel like the heartburn coming from policymakers tends to be, and I think correctly so, that you might be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Can you break down 
for taxpayers and listeners here. What what roughly are the numbers or percentages off the top of your head of property tax collection between those three categories, agriculture, commercial, and residential? And could it be some kind of a compromise that, say, the ballot measure eliminates residential for, uh, property taxes for primary residences and keeps it for the rest, and we try and make up for it from there? What would your response to that be? Uh I'd have to look at the specific numbers in terms of the three categories. I'm actually flipping through my my book right now to get the uh, some some accurate numbers for you. Uh, could it be just one segment? It's certainly possible, uh, but it depends on what the language looks like on the measure. And it has been presented as an overarching uh, property tax relief type proposal. So, I mean, the me the measure is what it is at this point. They've submitted it for approval for circulation. So, I mean, there's no. There's but no for all property taxes, say someone proposed that though, because they yeah. have, they have a differentiate, give it nuance, and I think it would it would not. I don't think it would directly address the heartburn people are getting because, in theory, agricultural land is being farmed and therefore uh, earning income. Again, not always the case. Just roll with me. Commercial land is supposed to have biz for profit businesses that are paying rent on their generating income. Your home that you live in and your, you know, your two older retirees that aren't earning income or three or however many, doesn't matter. Uh, that's where the heartburn is. They're they're essentially paying a, a North Dakota mortgage. My friends in Texas call it a Texas mortgage because their property taxes are so sky high. And I, I fear we're becoming that here. Well, there's no, there's no doubt that people aren't happy about their property tax and, and uh, numbers. And while valuations have increased and, and oftentimes it's presented that that's, there's a direct correlation. Uh, and there, there is to some extent, but again, it goes back to what are the, what is local government deciding to spend and what's their budget number overall? Uh, one, one thing that's interesting when we talk about home ownership in the state, and that's another component of this, uh, four out of 10 North Dakotans do not own a home. They rent. We have- and higher in places like Fargo, sorry to interrupt. Right, no, you're correct. We have one of the highest uh, rental rates uh, in terms of people living in North Dakota in the state, one of the higher uh, rental percentages in the nation. And I believe we are the fourth lowest in terms of home ownership. And, and a part of that is when you look at the university system, you look at NDSU, you look at N UND, uh, those aren't supposed to be homeowners at that stage in their life. That makes sense. Yeah, but but I, I have felt for a long time the percentage of renters versus homeowners has diminished the sense of community in a large part of the population. I mean, that's very much me talking to someone who lives, who lives in Fargo, and that's that is an opinion, not a fact. But it, um, I, well, it, I, I think we need to probably uh, end the the interview there. But I, I do think that. Um, it's going to be an interesting debate, and, and a lot of it gets back. I mean, I, what I've been saying for years is if you're upset about your property taxes, you know, talk to the people that levy them. It seems like we're constantly trying to solve, you know, implement a statewide solution, whether it's through the legislature or now the ballot box, for what's really a local issue. But I, I, that seems to fall on deaf ears. Brian, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Rob, and good visiting with you, Ben, as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Chad Cool, host of the Northland Outdoors podcast. Hey, here in the Northland, we love our time outside. And on the Northland Outdoors podcast, we're going to talk about all of it. Not just fishing, not just hunting, but mountain biking, camping, rock climbing, bird watching, you name it. We're going to have it on the Northland Outdoors podcast. New episodes every two weeks on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. So look for it and join us on the Northland Outdoors podcast. All right, just finished up our interview with uh, Tax Commissioner Brian Crosius, and you know that's going to be an interesting property tax debate. And I mean, clearly, I've in 2012, I should note, I was for eliminating the property tax. I was very much writing for. I have had a change of heart on that, and so, so of course, Port, you're a liberal now, which is which is not true. But I, the thing I struggle with, because again, I pay the property tax too. I'm not I'm not uh, real keen on it. Um, I think it's way too high. And the high. fun amount, it's got the double digits. Yeah, it's gone up in the last it's few gone up, years. It's gone it's, up ridiculously. It's insane in my neck of the woods, too. It's, but I, well, the thing that, that I struggle with is what do we replace it with? And I'm not sure that the legacy fund is a good answer. 
because again, the, I mean, the legacy funds earnings, the amount of revenue that it kicks off. And, and you got to remember how the legacy fund works. It gets deposits from oil tax revenues and, and those deposits may go up or down depending on oil taxes. But then the revenue it produces from how those billions in principle are invested is its own wow. revenue source. And the thing I worry about is that that revenue, so the legacy fund is a source of revenue, its investments and its returns as a source of revenue are not, are not tied to what drives needs for state spending, such as population increases, such as natural disasters, all the other things that can happen that can impact local yeah. budgets. Yeah. And so I, I think that's I, I think what would happen is is if we replace local property taxes with the legacy fund, what you're gonna see happen is local spending is gonna outstrip eventually what the legacy fund can can produce. And then all the local everybody's gonna go looking for more revenue. So that's gonna mean tax increases perhaps at the state level or if the locals aren't liking what they're getting from the state to brian's point you're going to see upward pressure on something like a local sales tax where some local already, sales taxes are uh, going up we are already out of the norm high on sales tax in the state people yeah. don't realize that i mean i, I am sorry maybe maybe, maybe then i tell us to my republican friends a lot but the air goes out of the balloon somewhere our property tax if you it, it's not a debate if you live in my neck of the woods if you want to avoid property taxes, you buy on the Minnesota side of the river. I mean, you will pay tens of thousands of dollars less depending on the property. Now, your income tax is going to be different, but sometimes if you do the math, it doesn't add out. And the sales tax here is exorbitantly high. It's at seven percent. Every purchase now has seven percent. Depending on, on the, the state, the state gum. Seven cents goes to the city of West Fargo. This Come well, on. well, two cents, five cents goes to the state. Two cents. Uh, goes yes, to correct. State. But it's it's still it's it's very high and. I yeah here here's here's the breakdown though for the political reality I fully support your mission on this this podcast and clearly I'm here every week of breaking down the nuance and the details behind these things very clearly what's going to happen is if we have messaging like this on the quote unquote two sides and I don't think Brian was trying to take a side against or for but if you have folks coming out saying well if we get rid of property taxes we're going to have to access the legacy fund and when you access the legacy fund here's the other upward pressure of the sales tax blah 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 blah, blah and it's just going to sound like charlie brown's parents to voters in the last two weeks of the election and then you're going to have rick becker and others coming out saying your property taxes are too damn high vote for this and we'll eliminate property taxes two sentences boom it's done yeah i mean i i think that increases the chances of that passing despite it not passing sure. and i really did want to hear from brian what is the difference between those three categories? Because it really does matter. Property taxes on commercial land versus ag land versus uh, primary owned residence, residential are totally different. If the other two are in any way somewhat sustaining of the things they fund right now, and these aren't fluff things, K through 12 education, roads and infrastructure, uh, then let's potentially take, you know, I would say that'd be a thing to take a look at as an alternative instead of what I'm seeing as throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which is what the, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're upset about, about if you're upset about property, I mean, there's some things you could do to, to broaden the property tax base. I mean, we have a lot of exemptions from property taxes. We could look at some of those. You broaden the base. Hopefully you bring down the rates. But I mean, the problem again is what's driving a wrong. lot of this. Those uh, interests will come in hot and heavy, but you're not wrong. Uh, but but, you know, well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're political non-starters. Like if you want to start, you want, you want to start looping in like like the tax exemption, you know, that, that some of the ag folks get. Um, I mean, that's a political non-starter. We're not going to do it. But. I mean, if you want to look at an effective way to lower property taxes, that's one way is to broaden the base. I mean, the problem is, is it's we've created this. You, we, we kind of committed an original sin. And it was back when the early days of my political writing career where the, the locals successfully blamed the state for high property taxes and the state obliged them by trying to do something about it instead of telling them, no, this is your problem. You tax you spend, you figure it out. Um, they, there's been an, I mean, they, the locals have successfully won that debate to the point I, I where I will say the locals have had to navigate. I actually have a little bit, a little bit of sympathy here where they were given the soft mandate by the legislature of saying you must have blank, blank and blank K through 12, this many roads, whatever 
Oh, and by the way, um, why don't you figure out how to pay for it? We're going to give you that. Um, we're going to give you that mandate or that expectation, and uh, you figure it out. Well, what's the alternative, though? I mean, what's the alternative? Is all all the decisions for school spending and Fund everything get made in start, Bismarck? Start bonding. Start bonding with the DOT. And and I'm sure. glad for the direction that Jack Dalrymple moved in that Governor Burgum kept, which was increasing the state's sure um, obligation I, to K through 12, and then make K through 12 budgeting more precise. Don't base it on last year's. Right. Base it on how many students are going to be there. It's all the, the silver bullet solution is bad because it's almost never a solution. The solution is believing in being an elected, believing you know having public sector. Uh, folks who actually believe in their work and getting the new, it, it's never going to be complete, but you're going to need to get it done every year. And that goes to my point about the poor forecasting as well. in the every other year session, you got to modernize government and make it more reactive and make it more interactive with what is actually going on versus, Hmm, I hope this is the case in 20 months from now. Yeah. I, but part of the problem is, is nobody, nobody wants to take responsibility for this. Nobody wants to, everybody wants to pretend it's somebody else's problem. Somebody else is creating the problem. And that's where we get to this, where it's become, the property tax issue has become intractable. The buy downs the legislature has done has have accomplished nothing, um, which we saw during the last legislative session. There was an alternative to the income tax cut, which was another property tax buy down. And Governor Burgum flat out came and said, I'm not supporting that. And he was right to, because they don't, all, all it's done is accumulate more local spending in the state budget. And so, I mean, there's a thing where, where North Dakotans, we want local control and we want local budget decisions made in our communities, but we don't like our property taxes, but we don't want to end any property tax exemptions to broaden the protect property. Something's got to give. And the problem is if we keep it intractable, what's going to happen is we're just going to blow up the whole system with the property tax measure. And that, you know, and maybe, maybe immediately in the first five years or 10 years, that'll be fine. But then down the road, I guarantee you, there's going to be pressure to create a local income tax. There's going to be a pressure because the rev the legacy fund's not going to be able to keep up with it. And then we're going to have squandered the legacy of the legacy fund on tax reform that pays short term benefits. I think that, I think that's a it's a terrible idea. It's and I've uh, I was against it. I was against it back in '04 because I thought again I was throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I'm now almost wrapped around a tish. Was the idea i don't know what the numbers are i was legitimately asking brian what those were and i i did want to hear more details and more concrete analysis from him and i i one i don't want to i i don't like criticizing someone after interviewing them and they're not here to respond to it but i think that when this subject is going to come before all north dakota voters and all north dakota voters who care about their state which in theory they all do well, who you go to when you want some information about tax collection, we have a, not yeah. every state has a yeah. tax commissioner. For instance, the state of Minnesota doesn't have a tax commissioner. I don't think South Dakota has a elected tax commissioner. We need information from someone like that. And very frankly, to take a little bit more of an activist role on something, something that's directly impacting taxes that voters are going to vote on. They need to know what the true ramifications are. Because very frankly, I think the list of bills spot or, um, a ballot initiative sponsors right now i don't think they're going to give you the nuanced detail oh, well, they're just going to say more freedom i would taxes. argue and this is this is uh, another another diatribe from rob against the whole ballot measure process i would argue we very rarely get nuance in these these ballot measure debates um because yeah. i mean let's uh, political slogans win um nuanced arguments do not they're at a dis i mean i shouldn't say they never win but they're at a disadvantage you know, if you can put your slogan on a on a bumper sticker, that's an advantage over people who have to sit down and explain, hey, long term, this is not a good decision for the state of North so, Dakota. So I, I think it's the responsibility of legislators and, and someone like a tax commissioner. And I would actually say Governor Burgum, too, because he is the well, governor. Well, let's, still, let's also remember we're, we're very early on in this process. They, they don't even have the measure approved for circulation yet. The signatures aren't even due until February. I mean, if they want to make the June primary ballot until February, April at the latest next year. We have a lot of time for that information. I'm not going to jump on, on Brian Crosses for not having it all at... Uh, you know, we invited him yeah. on to talk about this. So I, I don't, we, we, it's, have, it's, we have, we are, we have time to get this information. This, this time, this, this information needs to be out there. And I, I agree with you. We do need it soon because I don't want, I don't want false narratives to develop. If North Dakotans are going to make this decision, it needs to be an informed decision. 
we, and we got to get that information out there sooner rather well, than later before yeah. some of the some of the slogans take root. Um, we, we are early on, but narratives take place and uh, that's true. form and calcify very quickly. And if you yeah. don't have an alternative to this, it feels like a problem to most North Dakotans. Yeah. And people like Rick Becker are offering what he is calling a solution. And if you respond with, well, oh, he's, uh, he's offering down. he's offering snake oil. But the problem is, is, is arguing against it kind of sounds like you're arguing in favor of the status quo, which I am not. I don't like the status quo either. The problem is I don't want to I don't want to solve it with something that's worse. Um, I, and I think I think that's I, that's where we're at. this debate is certainly going to be going on quite a bit. I think we'll put a pin in it there for now. Ben, thank you so much as always. And we'll talk again. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library at inforum.com forward slash podcasts? We have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inforum.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.